I'd like to welcome Rachel Carvajal. She is a bilingual school psychologist for the New York City Department of Education. She's working in the Bronx, servicing two schools, the middle school and the middle school. She received her master's degree at Fordham University and has been living in New York City for the last six years. She's entering her fourth year as a school psychologist and is very passionate about what she does. Please welcome Rachel Carvajal. So, um, watching this film, you can't help but notice how far we have come in the last eight years with um, how many new and exciting ways there are to reach children through media. Um, so I guess I will uh, start us off um, with a question uh, that either of you can address. Um, are there uh, discernible differences today with um, smartphones being that much more accessible or any other um, evolutions in how our kids are uh, being targeted um, and impacted, or have you seen in the last eight years any sort of um, shift in, 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 perhaps in a positive way, uh, in how um, toys or products are being marketed to kids? Either one of you can start. I think we probably both have all kinds of things to say. Um, I want to answer your question, but I just wanted to first really say how impressed I am that anyone came out tonight, <laughs> even what's going on in the culture at large, that we're all, many of us still sort of feeling the aftershocks. And I think this film really speaks to them in a very clear way that there is a need for regulation and a need for government to be involved. Um, advocacy. And advocacy as well. I guess just to answer your question, I mean, I, I'm, Curious, um, there's a, there are a handful of kids in the audience. Um, where you were all kids once, and I watch this and I think this looks incredibly dated to me. Um, the issues are still the same, but I feel like it. This is like when um, before they put sugar in cereal, and all of a sudden, a few years later, there's sugar in everything we eat in terms of what's happened in the media, because now I think, um, I think kids are exposed to screens and become media literate ahead of us. So that, you know, I think many of us go to our kids or our grandchildren or a kid we know to tell us how to work our smartphone or how to look something up. And the advertising is embedded in their media so that we don't even see it anymore. It used to be you knew what was on the commercials and you knew what your kids were exposed to. I think these days we barely know what they're exposed to because it is so embedded in everything that they see on a screen and it could be movies, it could be what's on TV, it could be what's on their phones. So. I think in a way we really need to become media literate in a way that we never had to before. Um, there are some silver linings. <laughs> I think that advertising has become savvy to the fact that it needs to reflect diversity in a way that it never had pressure to do that before. And there's no question that the media affects our psyches. <laughs> And I think it does affect child development in ways that Im impact on self-esteem, that impact on identity from the very beginning. So I don't think there's any, uh, anything inherently bad with showing our children images of something that we might want them to think about that teaches them a value or teaches them things that um, are going to help them develop. But I think what, what's implicitly clear here and has gotten much, much more complicated is that we no longer let kids figure out who they are before they see media. So how do they feel about themselves? Who are they? How do they identify themselves? Um, I guess we'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a lot of thoughts about how to respond to that mm -hmm. in our culture. Alex. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, I think 
given my experience, um, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yep. Do I even need the mic? Yes, you need to hold it closer. Oh. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think given my experience, um, what you see in the school system is a lot of children with learning delays, I mean speech and language impairment, due to the fact that they are very, Thank you. I, would, I, wanna, I wanna use the word addicted, at this point, once they enter, once they enter the school system, to technology. I mean, you know, I work at a middle and high school, and kids, the minute they walk into the door, they have their cell phones and they're recording your conversation. Um, I think in my current school, I've been there for two years, and I think I've been more on social media than the president has, because um, it's getting to the point where these kids are just recording everything, and it's it's becoming difficult. You know, I'm speaking solely within the school system. Um, it's becoming difficult to really mediate conflict you know and a lot of these kids um, what's occurring is that everything is occurring now once they leave the building in social media right and it becomes difficult for parents to actually be able to deal with what's going on with conflict with peers and relationship building so a lot of these kids struggle with that interpersonal skills with their social skills and with that then that comes a lack of vocabulary would then cause learning problems I mean a lot of these kids are having difficulty express themselves and relating to others and you know, that all, something that the video touched upon was self-esteem development. You know, especially these marketers are targeting these kids at such a young age. And just like she was saying that that is the age of identity development. You know, how they feel about themselves, how they even interpret or even rationalize feelings, right? I, I know something that the video touched upon was that a lot of these children are, you know, with they're equating happiness to materialistic things. And then it becomes very difficult to really teach them, right, what what the foundation is, what priorities are, what what's the values of happiness, what's the values of relationship building and interpersonal skills. Um, I think I answered that question. Thank you you sure did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we'll have plenty, plenty more opportunities yeah. to touch on things. So does anybody want to kick us off with a question from the audience? Everybody wants to be the last question. Nobody wants to be the first, except Lisa. Thank you very much. Um, so, where are the professional organizations, pediatricians, education advocates that are going to the policymakers to say this is what we are seeing as a reflection of marketing and, and the health of our children? Where are we with that kind of advocacy? I think where we're at is that we need to do it more. Um, I think that. A lot of parents especially feel very hopeless in this regard, right? That I think marketing tactics are going past the parent, right? They're allowing these kids to have cell phones where they're being marketed, use the computer where they're being marketed, you know, and even within games they're being marketed. So I think that it's at a decline, unfortunately, because I think there's a lack of education, especially with parents, to educate themselves, to educate their children, um, and to actually make a difference. So I would encourage any parent to really speak to other parents about what's going on, especially with school-aged children, um, and also to elect government officials that stand for banding, you know, commercialization of childhood. And I think it starts with us, right? I think that we ourselves, within our community, within our family, need to educate other people um, to, you know, to have a voice to empower them and to communicate with each other and also teach the children. You know, I mean, this affects them as well. And I think educating them and that psychosocial awareness, I think, is very important. So to answer that, I feel like there is no place for it, right? Because of the fact that I think we need to empower people more. And I would say within the school system, there's only so much that we can do. There's only 180 days of school. You know, once they leave the school building, it's, they're dealing with different battles. I just, I'm sorry, I just have to follow up no, with no, that. Because in the schools, we are buying iPads. Yeah. We are doing assessments on computers. And we are, you know, vendors are coming to our schools and to our policymakers on a regular basis. And they're, we're up against big lobbying dollars, okay? And so the gatekeeper for my kids in the schools are the teachers, the administrators, um, even when they're going and seeing the social workers and psychologists in the schools. So my question is, as an industry, as, you know, parents are doing what they're doing, yes, my, you know, you know, trying to even figure out for themselves uh, in terms of the media. I mean, always had magazines with beautiful women or beautiful men on, on the magazines. But what are the, um, you know, professional associations and schools, you know, 
going to do, and I agree, parents need to step up and they, you know, we need to say what we want. But again, you know, the, there are schools that'll say, well, we were told this is a great online software and then you have product placement. You can have product placement on standardized tests, you know, in terms of questions. So, you know, some parents may not even know about that as well. So just as you're, you know, you work at, you know, the New York City schools and I, I just think, who comes to these decisions to bring these types of media or, or assessments to our schools? I, you know, I think I, I wish I had a better answer to, to your question. Um, I feel like I work on the ground and not so much um, looking administratively at what goes on. Is it turn on? Yes, it is. And you hold it hold it close. Sorry. Right? <laughs> I, you know, I think one of the things that's really clear from this film that was so striking is that when the government stopped letting the FTC regulate in 1980, when Ronald Reagan said, we don't need any regulation, um, all of a sudden advertising dollars skyrocketed and kids became consumers and we have lost that regulation for, for any kind of advertising. I know that a number of the people that are in the film are still associated with organizations. I think I know that um, the people sponsoring the series are giving out links to places where you can go to get more involved in that kind of advocacy. Um, so I, I don't think that there's a, the fact that none of us really can answer that question quickly <laughs> says to me that those groups that are out there trying to advocate don't have the support that they need. We, uh, not that I want to turn this into a, um, you know, a, a grief session about the recent um, electoral process, but uh, sitting there watching um, the 1980 election of, um, uh, thank you, uh, Ronald Reagan, and how that so directly impacted the uh, deregulation that has led to what the rest of the film is about and what we've all seen um, with children today. Um, at the end of the film, what I said to Susie um, was that this really is just a reflection of uh, the commercialization of our democracy at every level. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if, uh, if those advocacy groups, um, perhaps they just feel that they'd be banging their head against a wall. And uh, so they, they may be um, less motivated. I would like to say something. Um, given my experience, I will honestly say, unfortunately, in the United States, the education system is a business. You know, and a lot, depending where these schools are located, it's contingent on resources. So specifically, I work in the Bronx, and I'm in a low-income area. And given the lack of resources in my school, I do see that they tend to gravitate to these marketers within the school system because of the lack of resources. So unfortunately, that is the reality of our education system here in the United States. The fact that you have these poor income schools and these poor income areas, and they don't have a choice because of the lack of resources and the lack of funding that a lot of these schools have. So it's like they're, tr they're trying to make ends meet with whatever is brought to the table. And that's unfortunately the reality of where we're at today, especially in New York City, with the diversity of kids that we are targeting and the diversity of kids that we are servicing, that is what we're up against. First of all, thank you guys a lot for uh, the time tonight. And, um, I have a very small baby, and um, you know my wife and I are very much on the wavelength of type of things that we've been talking about here tonight. And I, I guess the, the one thing that I wanted to ask you and sort of point out is, you know, as you mentioned, the uh, the film is a little bit dated, and we think of this as sort of a sort of a category of marketing to children, but I think. A couple of things that you've touched on uh, makes me think that you know that's really just a subset of the broader picture, which is that many, many parents, and of course, you know, just all of us, society at large, are being asked to be less creative, be more consumer-oriented. <clears throat> Instead of using a digital device to create something we're uh, more and more being asked to use a, a digital device to just consume things that are presented to us and not question them. 
Um, and <clears throat> when you see adults um, depicted on commercials on television, they're pretty much, for the most part, they're stupid. <laughs> um, they, you know, they just have no interest in anything other than something that's very, very, um, you know, commercial in nature. And this is this same type of value projection that we're talking about in the film, and we're talking here for children. Um, I know in my own experience, I found that you know some parts of the country are sort of worse than others in terms of how much they they're culturally buy into the idea that you know if you go into a bagel place, you should be on the phone the whole entire time. Um, you know, it just it just seems to be more of a pervasive thing. For example, in New York City, where people are just about walking into telephone poles because they never walk away from their screen. You get on a subway car, and you know, 75 percent of the people in the car just never look up. You know, apparently there was a robbery in a bar, and the guy didn't even notice that the robbery took place because he was looking at his phone. He was just sitting there in the bar, looking, <clears throat> looking at his phone the whole time. So you know, we're becoming a society that. You know, is less aware, is uh, less critically uh, you know, able to think critically, um, and of course, a lot of these things just tie together, as you mentioned, the election and you know all these things. So, well, I mean, how much do you think about that? I mean, in terms of the parents, obviously, that you're dealing with, and the role model that they're setting, you know, for the children, obviously. I, there's so many different things. There's just so uh, much embedded I, I in what you're saying. Right. I guess one, maybe one thing I will speak to for a moment, although it may be somewhat transparent to say this, is I think one of the things that's important is to realize nobody hijacks your role as a parent. That's right. What? That's right. And it's critical that as parents we take back that power in a way. And I think. Um, one of the very basic antidotes to this, which is not the same as advocating for regulation, but I think is what we can do on the ground, um, and my daughter made me a sign to show everybody, um, <laughs> is to encourage our kids to actually make stuff in addition to buying it. Um, I see a couple of kids here, I'm wondering, how many people in the audience ever made a Halloween costume? So, a lot of people. I cannot tell you, I don't know, I see kids in New York City, I see kids in Westchester, I see kids who come from families where they, can, they never take a vacation, they can't afford. I see kids who go to Chappaqua and Scarsdale High School. Nobody makes their own things. Um, and it's really striking to me because in my office I have crayons and paper and not very fancy stuff. And every single person that comes in, whether they're a child, an adolescent, or an adult, picks it up and says, wait, can I use this? <laughs> and the, the power of actually countering the commercialization, I think, is also in our hands. You know, whether or not you encourage your kids to play, encourage them to do creative work, encourage them to think about the value of things they make. Um, I'm very curious about the next film in this series on happiness. So I think one of the things that, um, as you spoke to right off the bat, is that we've, we've forgotten that the, the value of play and creativity and what the role of that is in our mental health. And I think, so I, that's a partial response, I guess, to what you're saying. Yeah, and I, I, like I said, not lose sight of that. for myself and my own family, I mean, we're more inclined to, you know, sort of do things that way. The right. problem is every single relative and every person that you talk to thinks, Oh yeah, these brilliant baby products are great. Here, why don't you try this? Why are you using that? Why, you know, why they don't understand? Yes. The, I, this I, stuff. Did, did did every parent in this room kind of um, 
do a self-assessment on how you're so much better than these other parents, and then also acknowledge all of the things that you work places where you feel like you may have failed or not have been as good at making stuff or preventing your children access to things. I know I was giving myself an evaluation throughout the entire film. And quite frankly, most of the time I thought I was doing pretty well and then I realized I have two phones in my pocket and I am using them almost 24 hours a day on this every waking moment. So I'm setting a terrible, terrible example for children who are not allowed to have their own phone and very little screen time of any kind. Um, but uh, so I give myself checks in, in all the categories and uh, I just I imagine I'm not the only one who kind of went through that process. You know, I also alienated a lot of grandparents because I'm very um, uh, rigid about uh, Christmas and birthday presents. And, and, and uh, so I think if you want to be a difficult child, it, it can be beneficial to your own children. I, I wanted to just respond, I guess, to what you're saying also, which is I think that what we do as adults still counts. <laughs> if your kids see you on a screen all the time, <coughs> Behavior. It's a learned behavior and they learn to value that. You, I know I sit at my table with my teenagers and I say no screen time and then my phone rings and I have to really work to say I'm not going to answer it. And I think um, so I think going back to sort of our grassroots in that way is really critical. The one no thing that I did want to say is um, I think it's a very interesting correlation that as our society becomes more technology driven. Mental health, there is an influx on mental health when I speak about anxiety, depression, I mean low self-esteem. I mean there's such, there's such a correlation. I'm, you know, even working within the school systems, you see now more than ever, kids are coming in in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder. Mm -hmm. You know, having difficulties functioning within the classroom, having difficulties relating to their peers, and having difficulties functioning overall in a structured setting. Did you want to? Well, what would like to the, just one, one thing, there's an answer for that. You just watch the World Series and you have biotechnology commercials the whole entire time. So kids, you know, children are watching these ads that are telling them you're going to take prescription drugs mm -hmm. for every single problem yeah, that you are. have. Right. Yeah. I think there's also another factor there, though, which is, uh, you know, the actual data on whether watching a screen causes depression or causes ADHD is still, I mean, the science of that is not clear. I think there are a lot of things being studied looking at brain development and, and the marketers are studying it before the scientists are. Um, part of the issue there is that kids who spend their days watching a screen are not getting that interaction. So your kids who are in school who go home and they spend their whole afternoon playing video games and maybe they talk to someone on the video game, they don't have that empathic development that happens when you're sitting and someone's looking at you. Even in the film, they're holding their babies on their laps looking at the screen. And I think, so one of the ways we counter that is to make sure we put in that time with our kids um, and that they have that face-to-face -face contact even if you're talking about marketing, and this is just one last thing I'll say before going back to questions, which is our kids are so media literate, and I think it's important to talk to them about it. This whole notion that advertisers are tricking our kids from the get-go, kids don't like to be fooled. They like magic, they like magicians, they like... But if you say to your child, you know, they're trying to get you to buy that. What, how, do you think, how do you think they do that? What is it that goes on? What would you do if you were making a commercial for our dinner? Or, I, I think there's something to getting our kids to be critical thinkers about what's going on from really early on too, that could be helpful. Building resiliency, that's very important. Hi, um, I have a Priscilla Croton, so I deal with three, three, four, and five-year-olds, actually even older twos. And um, when children come into the program, we give their parents sort of like a profile where they can give us information about their children so we get to know them a little better. And um, one of the questions is, what does your child like to do? What do they like to eat? Um, what toys do they like to play with? What makes them happy? What makes them upset? 
And one of the ones I recently got was for a child who wasn't three yet. And what makes her upset is when parents take away her electronics. It's unbelievable how young these kids are starting. But I, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, not in terms of a maybe professional organization, but thinking back to like consciousness raising, parents really do need to band together because it's too hard. It, I think it's hard when you're, you know, just one person in your kid or one family in your kid, because they're under so much pressure to conform to what everyone else is doing. And it takes a lot of courage to stand up and say no. Just no. You know, so we, I think there's strength in numbers. And if you have neighbors or friends or your kids have, you know, you are friends with other people, you get together and you talk about it. I mean, I try to educate my parents all the time because we're talking about kids buying things, but the reality is they're not buying things. Their parents are buying things for them. You know, parents complain about their kids having so much toys, and you kind of wonder, wait a minute, <laughs> who's buying this? Stuff? You know, it's like we're really, we're intelligent people, and yet it's so much easier to just buy it than to say, to put up with, <laughs> you know, whatever comes next when you say no, but there's so much power in just no, we don't believe in that, you know. How about unplugging the TV? Yeah, I, yeah. I had a kid once, a parent once, who said, my child insists on watching X, Y, and Z. And I said, well, how can he insist? He's three. Of course, these aren't my kids. <laughs> so, thank you. Consumer Reports. And when I first started there, one of the first things that we did uh, is we would buy all the toys that were out there. We would pick toys apart. We would test the paint. We would see how dangerous these toys were. This was part of the consumer advocacy that we did. It was about product safety. Uh, as toys and children's products actually became safer from the direct physical uh, aspects of them, we Consumer Reports stopped doing that and started concentrating on telling people where to get Black Friday deals. That's another story. But the idea is that this is also a consumer, consumer product safety question, that, this, that these things are affecting children's psyches. It's affecting their, and I don't know why. Nobody has ever addressed this as a product safety question, and look at going to those avenues rather than going to the FDC, going to the Consumer Product Safety Administration. Has anybody ever thought about doing that? I don't know the answer, but I think it's, I think it's a great That's idea. Okay. I mean, I think that I, if we're talking about mental health to start with, that it's off the grid in terms of when pe people think about product safety, I don't, I'm not aware of anybody going forward with that level of analysis, but I think it's an important one. There was a new report put out um, about um, sleep deprivation and, you know, children, oh, I'm sorry, I just want to, which, you know, with everything, you know, having it relate to a, a science report or scientific study, there was a report recently put out about sleep deprivation and how children are falling asleep with their phones and their computers and they're addicted. And um, what Rachel was saying, I just hear spot on in, in terms of mental health, and s nobody's really mentioned, mentioned suicide rates mm -hmm. and what's gone up. And, mm -hmm. you know, and this, you know, being um, put in, in those positions. but. Definitely, I, I think that's that's brilliant in terms of consumer safety um, and the mental health safety. Mm -hmm. I, you know, there have been some studies that are not widely published on the impact on violence in video games mm -hmm. with kids. And any of us who have kids or who work with kids know that kids watch games and they get models of how to handle conflict or how to speak to people or what's appropriate or. And even if they understand that their games are fantasy, it's still what they're getting trained um, linguistically. I've worked with a couple of very astute school psychologists who can talk to a kid, not ask them anything about what they watch or look at on the screen, and just by their language, mm -hmm. take a pretty good shot at what, they, what they're looking at on TV or what they're watching on a screen or what movies they see, just by 
the language patterns they use and the vocabulary they use. So I think that, I don't think it would take um, much to come up with that data, but I haven't seen it. I see it on an you know, individual basis and in schools. I haven't seen anybody studying it in a way that's really trans translated to this. To kind of piggyback, um, just on the violent video games, I feel like a lot of these kids are becoming desensitized to violence. So it becomes the norm. You know, that's the way they automatically react to things is through violence. Um, within my school, I mean, the, the rate of suspension due to fights is outrageous. I was just reading a report that about, I believe it was 26% of suspensions reoccur every year for the same thing, for the same issue for fighting. And that's ridiculous that the same kids are getting suspended for the same thing. You know, it, it really talks about how punitive our system is and how we are not really targeting what is going on with these kids and meeting and addressing their needs in a way that is gonna lead to success emotionally um, and academically as well. You know, it makes me think of something that um, some people here may be familiar with. There was a very well uh, designed and carried out study that was done by someone at Harvard who was studying eating disorders who went to an island off the coast of Fiji, one of the smaller islands, prior to the time that they developed, prior to the time that they were bringing TV to the island. And they interviewed people about their feelings about their bodies. And it was an island that was, that valued round women who were um, very different than the ones they were about to see on TV. And they assessed, they did a huge assessment of the people on the island and their levels of happiness and their levels of contentment with their lives prior to introducing TV. And then they went um, back maybe five years after They'd been watching, and at that point, I think the shows at that point were Beverly Hills, um, no, I don't, <laughs> um, it was that generation, whatever it was. And there was a huge percentage of women especially, but it affected the men too, who were reporting they were unhappy with their bodies, they were starting to develop eating disorders, um, significant, unequivocal data. And then they went back again and those percentages went up. In an island study where there had previously been zero eating disorders that they were aware of, um, you could watch the development of mental health issues there. Um, I, don't, I imagine there are other people who have done that through departments of sociology and anthropology, but it hasn't hit the consumer reports <laughs> safety level. This movie triggered so much, I don't know if I have a beginning, middle, and end, but I'm gonna try. Um, first of all, there was a 90-year-old piano teacher. She told me, children, they're not climbing trees. They don't have finger dexterity. Um, someone else I know, their son is a drone operator. And I found out, I think through the film, that they are targeting people, young men, who have watched these videos and really mastered somehow it translates. Um, as an elder for, who for 35 years has been a protector of the air, water, food, soil, um, and as a parent who has struggled with this, one of the things I did with the grandparents is ask them to buy at tag sales. You know, consumption for me, it, it makes me shudder because all I think about is where it's going, to an incinerator or a landfill. Um, and about a year and a half ago, I was so depressed is the only word, grief, just completely like it's gotten worse, even though I've been an advocate for all these decades. And all I want to do now is work on solutions. Now, I co-presented this weekend at the Farm-Based Education Conference. Uh, I know there's a program in the Bronx. Alice Waters, the edible schoolyard, is getting gardens into schools. There is a woman who transformed a whole um, hospital in Litchfield, Connecticut to fresh food. She got them to plant a garden, got the local farmers to grow food for the hospital. 
we had this woman come and speak to medical students in Valhalla and we gardened with them. I think, for me, and I've been thinking about this for a long time, but somehow tonight I feel like I'm being pushed. Um, I, I treasure this series, I really do. And I think we need to have circles, even if it's a monthly support group, where we really come together and say, what can we initiate? What, how can we support you um, in what you want to do? And how can we, because I know for me, I, in many ways, shopping farmer's markets, I kept my children, at least from the obesity and diabetes and things, and we cooked. But everywhere we went, I mean everywhere, if when we lived in Brooklyn, I don't go to the dry cleaner anymore, but they would hand them a lollipop. The bakery, they'd give them a cookie. It's, so I hear what you're saying, but I think because of politicians, like right, my question is, what can we do in five minutes for five dollars that you don't need a politician or the person you live with? <laughs> no offense for people working on all the agencies, but I can't wait anymore. I can't wait. We are, people watch TV and take those drugs. I'm going on, she wants the mic. I'll, let, <laughs> I'll stop. But anyway, I don't know who here wants to continue the conversation, um, but we have to take charge. We have to initiate and really step up, because if we don't, it's only gonna get worse. And I just thank everyone here who's been a part of it. Thank you. You know, just a, a quick, doesn't cost a lot, doesn't, but take some real advocacy, I think is to argue for playtime in schools, because when kids are given time to play, they figure this stuff, they, they develop things that they don't develop if they don't have that time. And I think there's been a huge movement towards making sure everybody gets their academics in so they get testing and, their, and the schools get money for that. I think putting pressure on schools to really create time for play um, is one, one of the many small ways. It's like the not, eat, not serving sugar in school cafeterias. <laughs> Um, yeah, just want to, this is quick, but every time my son asked me a question, I asked him the question back first. <laughs> Asking children questions is so important. Mm -hmm. You know, our, my children are still pretty young. I, I always like to bring things back to Ostley. Um, most of us are from this community, um, and, and though we are very grateful for folks who come to our series from outside the community, um, my kids are still pretty young there at Claremont. I'm just wondering as they, as you get older and you're in the middle school and the high school, um, the stuff that we saw here, like sh you know, sugary drinks and, and Coca-Cola and, and Snapple, is that, are there vending machines with that kind of stuff that um, is available in your cafeterias? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. you know, eat fresh local food, and then the next slide showed the vending machine around the corner with all the sugary drinks, so it's a mixed message. I wonder, not to put anyone on the spot, but since there is there are some kids here, if you'd be willing to say anything about what you thought about the film, or what you think about what people are saying. And how it you affects you. You can opt out, but. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I just moved here and where'd you move from? The Bronx. The Bronx. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, what I've seen, I'm moving kind of slowly, but um, <laughs> what I've seen is that little kids, they um, question have you seen a difference no. in the schools between let's say like the Bronx and no. Austin yeah. yeah yeah what are some of the differences I'm curious um, the people the schools um, the neatness the way people act the teachers the students basically everything 
<laughs> are you are you happy to be here? Yeah. Okay. Good. Happy, happy. Thank you. Um, a lot of people said about this being dated. It's not actually that old movie. It was only seven years ago. Um, and I'm thinking about the influence of time in this. Like, I was born in 1959, so I came, I was young at a particular time of marketing to children. And there's kind of a sense in the film of like compared to normal, right? Compared to when kids went out to play baseball until it got dark. And I'm wondering, like, it's becoming more and more immersive, which means that the professionals, like school psychologists, have grown up in a very different media environment than I grew up in. And they're starting to experience as normal mm -hmm. what they grew up with, which is already incredibly saturated. So, I don't know, it seems like part of Part of that is elders have a responsibility to remember what it used to be like. Susie's coming to you. Hi, I have two, uh, two questions. One is about um, the um, American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations about um, screen time for children. They mention it in the film, but um, I'm a family doctor, and I so I try to follow this, but um, I um, think they just released their new um, guidelines, which they, they, I think they took the age down right. to 18 months, I think, but there's some other nuances that I don't know, so I don't know if one of you or someone else in the audience could, um, could accurately represent that. And my second question is, um, maybe to the person who said he worked for Consumer Reports or, or somebody else, because I was remembering when I was a kid, um, they were talking in the film, just briefly they mentioned about um, educating, and, and you mentioned it, about talking with kids about what media and what advertising is, um, and like telling them like, oh, they're trying to sell you something, what do you think, you know? Um, and I remember when I was a kid, my parents got us, my dad always really liked Consumer Reports, and um, they got us a subscription to the kids, it was published by Consumer Reports, and it was called Zillions, and it was mm -hmm. this awesome magazine for kids, and that was all about advertising, and it was really cool. My sisters and I loved that magazine, and I have a six-year-old, a three-year-old and six-year-old, and I've been looking for this magazine, and clearly it doesn't exist anymore, but I uh, was wondering if anybody knows, is there anything comparable? Because I thought, I remember loving it. Like, we, it was really fun, and it was all about looking at, like, what ads are and what they're trying to do to you. Um, and it was fun, it wasn't like dry and boring. So is there anything like that now? And what happened to Zillions? And why did they stop that? <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what got happened to Zillions is Consumer Reports actually changed from being a consumer advocacy organization to an organization that just rates products. Oh, you see sense. very little consumer advocacy. And when they do it, it's something that's already been done by someone else, like um, like uh, how much uh, toxins are in words or something like that's been looked at by someone else. Mm -hmm. So Bill looked at them and Someone that is trying to keep people from consuming, they make their money by selling magazines and website subscriptions to consumers. Great. Well, um, letting your children run free to gain that creative experience. Could there be a correlation between that and the idea that you want your child to be safe and the safest place for your child is in your house in front of a screen? Could that be sort of in that realm, per se? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I, when I consult with parents and I ask them, you know, what is it that your child does on the weekend? Oh, he's home in his room playing video games and I know he's home, and I know he's safe, and I know his whereabouts, so I like it that way. But we, we tend to overlook the consequences. This kid is socially awkward. He doesn't have the vocabulary enough to express himself. 
you're having difficulty learning in the learning environment because of that, right? Because we're not engaging our kids in that type of dialogue, because we're not allowing them to play with other kids, right? Because they're on a screen. They're sitting in the room alone watching a screen. I mean, how much educational benefit or even developmental benefit is that? You know, and I think especially in New York City with the crime rate, you know, and everything that's been going on lately, especially this past year, I think parents just feel security of knowing my kid is home in his room, right? But I think that we need to encourage parents to really think about what is it that they're doing and what is it, what are, what are the benefits of the activity in which they're engaging in, right? Is it gonna have long-term effects on their development and their growth as a learner? And I think that's where we really need to push and have dialogues with these parents and within our communities and within our families. You know, it becomes such a norm when you visit a relative's house and you're like, where are the kids? Oh, they're in the room playing video games. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, let's bring them out. Let's play, let's talk, let's catch up. You know, I think that aspect is really missing in a lot of today's families. And, it, and it's a shame because there's so much benefit on interacting and socializing and that even that nonverbal communication, right? It doesn't even have to be verbal. It can even be nonverbal communication is so powerful that it's really lacking in our generation of kids today. I was just gonna say, I um, used to work for a woman who came from a very wealthy family. And uh, she said that their families um, would not buy any things for the kids, but they would buy them any experience that they wanted. They would buy them books or experiences. And just we're approaching um, the shopping season. Uh, Thanksgiving's just a couple of weeks away, Black Friday. May I have your attention please? The library will be closing in a half hour. Please note the computers will be shutting down in about 15 minutes. I was just wondering, um, we hear about millennials and they're very experiential. The businesses that are succeeding today are businesses that um, provide people with an experience. It's, uh, downtowns are really only um, for fine wines and restaurants because that's what millennials want to experience. Um, so I'm just wondering if any um, families, if you have any thoughts or suggestions uh, as we are approaching the uh, shopping season, uh, of what, what are things that, that would be uh, positive influences for kids that people um, can enjoy as a family? Um, Amy. So when the grandparents ask what we want to give kids for Christmas and birthdays, um, I often say things like a Bronx Zoo membership family or a T-Town membership, um, soccer, any kind of extracurricular activities that I can't afford, um, things like that, because then the whole family can benefit from it. Thanks. Excellent suggestions. Yeah, so this is a bit off topic. I want to just go back to um, to the panel. Um, do you think that the the school has a role in consumerism? I mean, I know we've been talking mostly about screens, but that's not the only thing that's of concern, right? It's, the concern is that we are a ridiculously materialistic culture, and we ourselves have been trained to consume, and our kids, we're training our kids to do the same, and the way we are doing it is by buying them things, and say, you know, we're role models. So, you know, there's so many parents working, life's so stressful for so many people, I guess a lot of people don't think that this, that's the school's job. You know, your job is just teach academics, but I'm not sure I agree with that. But anyway, you know, do you think that the school has a place in helping parents um, see things differently, you know, in terms of health problems, both mental and physical, that, you know, all of these things, could the school take some sort of leadership position? I think absolutely. Um, I think that, oh, sorry. <laughs> I think that starts, I mean, a lot of schools have PTAs, right? And that I think is a great platform where parents can get involved and really advocate and have workshops and educate individuals on exactly you know, the commercialization of childhood and the effects of it. So I think absolutely the schools can do much more than what they're doing now. Um, you know, even at parent-teacher conferences, that is now occurring in New York City four times a year. I mean, that's an awesome opportunity to have parents, all parents in the same place, and allow that to be a learning opportunity for parents, you know, and really make a difference in their children's lives, so absolutely. I think also 
beyond the parents. I do a lot of school consulting and I've, I've done some consulting to districts and sometimes for individuals and I think that there are places to make programmatic changes in schools. I know um, this may be a little off topic but I think it's actually related. I'm a big proponent of teaching kids mindfulness, which is not something that costs the school anything. It doesn't take a lot of time. Um, you have to train your faculty to do it, and you have to value it, but it teaches kids to slow down. Yes. It teaches kids to um, identify their feelings. It teaches kids all kinds of things, and I'm, there's a lot, there, this is an area where there is a lot of data. Um, they've done this a lot more in California than they have in New York studying it, but if you look at preschool kids or kindergarten kids, K through 12, and you begin teaching them mindfulness, and some people call it meditation, some people call it sitting time, there are a lot of different names for it. Um, you take kids and for five minutes a day, three or four times a week, in the craziest classrooms, with the kids that are the most out of control, um, and over a period, of, a short period of time, within a six month period, you can study it, and there is data here, um, that those kids start to be able to self-regulate differently. They start to manage conflicts in places like playgrounds or in the lunchroom differently, and they go home and they teach their parents to do it. Um, so I think, I think that it, that's one kind of a program that um, doesn't cost a lot of money. It requires a change in consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a lot of other places where it makes a difference. I know, I don't, I'm not familiar with what happens in the Austin schools. I know in the Chappaqua schools, when you get to middle school and high school, they have partnered with um, body product places to teach kids health classes. So. Kids come home with always tampons and Old Spice deodorant, and the whole notion of sort of introducing brands for life, I think, is permeating the school system. I don't know as much what goes on in the Bronx, but I can imagine there's an equivalent because everybody's looking for extra funding. Mm -hmm. Even in the Chappaqua schools and the Scarsdale schools, they're getting vendors to come in and give them extra money so they can teach. And it's a paradoxical problem. They're teaching about suicide and eating disorders, but they're handing out always products and things to make sure that you're well-groomed and you don't smell. You know, it's a, so I think there are a lot of places to make changes. The last thing I would say is I think there's a place to teach kids um, media literacy. And they refer to that there. You know, I don't know a single kid who wouldn't opt to take a class where they could sit and be on a computer and think about what's going on there and trade that for their handwriting class or some <laughs> other class. I, you know, I think there's a, there's a place to teach our kids to become consumers in a different way. Well, we're coming to a close. Is there one final question that somebody wanted to ask that's really a burning question for you? Otherwise, I'm going to give our panelists a final word. There, there are a number of um, resources, I believe, not necessarily referring to that book, but a number of resources that are um, printed out on the tables outside when you, when you leave. Um, and also, as you walk by, do you want to prompt me? I believe that it's okay for people to become a friend of the series on the way out of the you're right, Paul. It is okay to become a friend of the series on your way out of the theater. If you look for a beautifully decorated box of butterflies on it, you'll see tiny little envelopes. If you would like to put a donation and suggest a donation of $20, become a friend of the series, and you'll see your name up on the screen the next time you come to the screening. I look forward to seeing many of you in December. I'm going to ask our panelists if they have a final word of advice or thought that they'd like to share with us. And then before um, anybody departs, if all of the members of the committee will get up on the stage. We'll take a picture of our panelists, with our panelists. But please, give us your final word, final um, thought that you didn't get to express or you just want us to have in mind as we walk out tonight. Um, I just want to encourage everyone to just start talking. You know, 
speak to other people. This issue is affecting everybody. It's not just in one area, it's affecting everybody. So I think the more we talk about it, the more awareness we're bringing. And you know, with that, we can hope for change. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm going to hold up my sign one more time. <laughs> I promised my daughter, but I really believe in this message. You know, there's um, the, the third panelist who couldn't be here tonight is somebody who's a big food advocate. And I think she would have spoken a lot to the parallels with the processed food market. And, you know, there's been a movement around the idea of eating real food that's really caught on. Um, in some walks of life, Michelle Obama took it on. Um, I guess we'll see what happens next. Um, Melania Trump has suggested she's going to take on bullying, which will be a really interesting thing to watch if that actually happens. Um, she's got a lot of experience with it, I guess. Um, but, I, but I think something like just making stuff, thinking about making things, showing your kids that you make things, um, thinking about gifts for the holidays, in addition to experience, things that help you make things, musical instruments, art supplies. Um, kids who never, who, kids get labeled really early on as an artist or a soccer player or the video nerd or, and we have to learn to, to not let our kids take on those labels so early. Um, you know, I think, so I also encourage to sort of expand your kids and your own bandwidth um, as a way of modeling for them and encouraging them to, to, to broaden their experience. And I just want to say one last thing to your question about the safety of being at home looking at a screen. You know, I think that we all want our kids to be safe, and I do think um, at the end of the day, if you don't have childcare and your kid's coming home and they're, the trade-off is either they're gonna be alone sitting watching a video game or they're gonna be out on the streets doing something that could be really dangerous, it's safer <laughs> to be at home. But I think that that isn't the end of the road. I, I think this connects really to everything. It connects to funding our education, to funding childcare, to thinking about regulation, and then to going grassroots to what we do at home. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this month.